No mouse though, because this is the 50s. Actually, mouses did technically. Mouses, mice? No keyboard, it's the 50s. Welcome back, and today we're sculpting up some retro computer terminals for use in Fallout Wasteland Warfare, or just, you know, generally as objective markers. But before we get into that, this video is brought to you by Good Games Maitland. They haven't actually sponsored us. Uh, I just think they're a great local business here in the Newcastle and Hunter region. Uh, so if you live somewhere around Newcastle or the Hunter in New South Wales, Australia, go check them out as they are good people, and you should support your local game store. Also, thanks to our Patreon supporters, who get early access to everything that we sculpt before I eventually get around to putting it on the web store. That'll happen eventually. But for now, if you want anything that we've sculpted over the last few months, check out our Patreon. It's all there. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okie dokie. So let's get started on these terminals. So, fresh blender. First thing we're going to do, of course, is click into Blender and select all of the objects and get rid of them. Um, we're then going to look at some reference images. So, um, 50 style computers. Uh, this one's pretty cool. I'm kidding, we're not doing that one. Okay, so, a few trends I am seeing between all of these different computers. Um, they're big. They're all quite big and they tend to have a lot of dials and stuff. Uh, so, I reckon we're going to use a shape something like this for most of them, because it gives us a little bit of space down the bottom there for a, uh, what's it called, keyboard, should we, for the bit where there's actually a screen that you can, uh, you know, type and put stuff into, as well as some that has dials, maybe some that has just panels of switches would look cool, and we'll have them so, you know, they're all individual bits that you can all glue together in whatever configuration you like. So, we need to start by getting a basic shape, something like this down, I think. So, the first thing that we need to do when working out how big to make this thing is we want to know roughly how tall it's going to be, and then we'll work the proportions to look sensible off of that. So, I've got uh, my Nora from Fallout Wasteland Warfare that is going to be our guinea pig for this. So I'm just going to take a measurement of how tall she is to eye level. And that is about 27 and a half millimeters. So we want the middle of the, maybe even the top of the screen. No, we'll go middle of the screen to be about 27 millimeters tall, I think. Set our units to make sure that, you know, we're making it 27 and a half millimeters up to her eyes, not 27 and a half meters. That would not work at all. We'll start with a cube. Seems sensible enough. So basically what I want to do with this cube is make it so that it's kind of this shape. So it's, you know, more or less a cube with like a side of an octagon cut into it. That, that seems like a reasonable way to describe this. Okay, so that gets us the basic shape of uh, this thing. And the way that we made this shape was pretty simple. Um, we just put some control loops in and then we grabbed the, um, you know, edges that we wanted to pull out, out, uh, giving us this shape. That was a really crappy explanation of that. Now, I think I want to detail this base shape that we're going to use for this thing a little bit more. Uh, having it just drop off here, kind of boring. If we go look back at our reference picture, it kind of curves back in a little bit. And then there's like cupboards and stuff down the bottom here. So we're going to throw a control loop in and we're going to bring it up. Well, if we bring it up to there, that's at 15. So if we go... 13.5 that gives us a one and a half mil little lip there now something else i've noticed with this image is that at the base here there's another little lip in right at the bottom so we're going to add that little bit of detail as well in much the same fashion we did 
um, just by you know putting our control loop down, extruding in, getting rid of any bits we don't need. Because really, given that it's you know 50s era computer, it should have a cathode tube, which I. I mean, most of my audience should be the age that you know what a cathode ray tube is, an old CRT screen. Uh, they, they, they're quite deep. Ah, yes, the cupboards underneath. We should probably include those. So, for those, I have an idea. I'm going to select this face, and yeah, we're going to have it so that the cupboards will kind of open out from the center underneath the cabinet I think so we're actually going to inset this square like so and then we'll make it ooh, a bit more rectangular you know and move it across a bit might even bring this edge in some more uh, I'm not sure let's um, fiddle around with it and see how it looks There we go, that works nicely. And that'll all be smoothed off um, and it won't be quite as deep when we put the subsurface division on. Um, which I have to throw it on now just to see what it comes out like. It, um, yeah, it's coming out circular, we'll have to fix that up a bit. We'll keep that off for now while we're getting this basic shape in. Um, and now we need, you know, a kind of handly type thing. One hour later. We might even have those as just panels that are like riveted in place. That could work quite well as... That could work quite well also. Or as well. Could work as... Could work well as well. That, that's a weird sentence. I'm going to let it sit in the background what I'm going to do about this panel for a bit. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and uh, make the CRT screen that will be placed in some of these. And some of them will just have dials and switches and stuff. Um, I'm going to use Boolean operations to join those in, most likely. Okay, so the plan for the CRT screen is very simple. We're just going to have a cube. We're going to inset in a little bit from one of the faces, and then right at the middle of that face, we'll pull it forward, and then when, when the Boolean is added, it'll give a nice curve to the screen. Okay, so, um, yeah, inserting here, when we added the subsurf, it didn't work real well. So instead, we're going to turn this into a grid, and then inset the grid, and then pull it out from there. There we go, that gives us a bit more of a, um... A bit more of a rounded feel. It feels a bit less, you know, square and modern. Oh yeah, that's much better. It feels less flat right at the center of the screen now. That's a drastic improvement. Okay, next thing that we need will be a keyboard. Because we want some of these terminals to have a keyboard input. No mouse though, because this is the 50s. Actually, mouses did technically. Mouses, mice? No keyboard, it's the 50s. I think the plan for the keyboard is basically to do up a grid and then extrude keys up out of it and then inset each of the keys to get, you know, kind of that tapered shape with a gap and we'll make it so that the grid spaces for the gaps are slightly smaller. We now have keys for our keyboard, which is handy. Um, so that turned out to be a lot easier than I thought it would be. Just create the grid and then select the verts that we want for the key. In this case, they are five vert squares. 
extruded them up in the pattern that we wanted, uh, which is this, you know, each row is offset by half a key. Uh, and then we, the spacebar was a bit tricky because if we just scaled it straight in, um, it would scale in more on the X axis than the Y axis. So we worked out how much scaling on the Y axis would look good and then scale the X axis so that uh, this vert at the corner, um, where it goes down to the corner base, um, would, you know, be at about a 90 degree even angle between the two. Uh, we then used 0.8 for 80% shrinkage um, on each of the top of the keys by pressing numpad 7. Going to a top down view, we can then select the verts just with the box select tool. And it would just select the top of the key cap, allowing us to just shrink it in to 80%, uh, which that has worked quite well. Um, I think I will knock some of these off the top or maybe even put some more down the bottom just to have a bit more of a, um, what's it called? I forget the word. If I remember the word, I will let you know. A bit more of a bezel. There's the word. Uh, at the bottom of the keyboard. If I'd planned this out a bit better, I would have shifted all the keys up. Uh, but we're going to pull them down, then extrude, then add in some control loops so that when we add the subsurf to smooth this thing out a bit, it comes out nice. So let's do that. You know, hindsight being what it is, I should have just grabbed the bit from the top, brought it to the bottom, used it as a marker, extruded down, and then just added new control loops in rather than going through and reattaching that piece. Would have been much quicker, lesson learnt. As is, just with a subsurf, that doesn't work too badly. Uh, there's a couple of slight changes that I want. Each of these keycaps, I want them to kind of be dipped in so that a finger could go into them nicely um, and I don't want them curving that much around that edge. I'm gonna have to add a control loop to every single one of them. Now that gets the top of the keys going around a little bit nicer. Uh, now I want a divot in each and every one of them. And to do that we're just going to grab the you know, four verts and lower them down just a little bit and that should pull it into a nice little recess, I hope. There we go, adds a nice little divot. It's a piece of detail that will be barely perceivable once it's printed just purely due to scale, but I think it's an important piece of detail as it'll look a little bit off if it's not there and you just won't quite know why. Okay, so now we should probably make the base of the keyboard a little bit more three-dimensional. I think I might have just crashed it and I didn't save. One eternity later. Whew, that was lucky. I thought we had lost all of that progress for a moment, so let's save it. There we go. We now have a nice little keyboard with some thickness. Nice. Um, with control loops. I've turned the subsurf down to one because you've got to remember this piece is going to be quite small. Uh, so we don't need, you know, super smooth curves because just the printing process itself will smooth it out a little bit more. So there we go. We now have a keyboard. So that's, we can check that off our list. The next thing that we need is some little blinky warning lights, I think. And I think the blinky warning lights um, are going to exist in a couple of forms. I want a tall panel that can be like put onto here, so I know it might move the monitor across a little bit, and then you can have a little panel of blinky lights there. And I also want blinky lights able to go down where the keyboard is for different variations of this thing. So I mean, this would be the actual terminal itself, um, and then you could put another box right next, another one of these right next to it that's just covered in blinky lights and switches. For the light panel up the side, I think we're going to start with circles, extrude them out to make lights, and then join them together, I think is going to be the best way to do this. There 
we go. Some nice, a nice little blinky light indicator panel thing. That's what we're calling it. Look right here. Blinky light indicator panel thing. It'd help if I could spell. There we go. It's a blinky light indicator panel thing. I think I had exaggerated that a little bit too much. But I think these will actually just be access panels. So we'll just end up putting little rivets in around the perimeter of them. Um, so they'd like get pulled off that way. Um, we're gonna need to add rivets for riveting stuff like the keyboard down, which I should probably add into the keyboard model itself as well as this thing once we finalize the scale of that. The next day. Okie dokie, a couple of things that I want to change, I'll put some thoughts into since yesterday. Um, I think this keyboard's way too big uh, because this desk bit is supposed to be at waist height and this keyboard is longer than the waist height, which means this keyboard's like, you know, a meter long which keyboards are not, they're about half that. So I think we need to scale this keyboard down to about half that size. I think that's about the right size for the keyboard. I've also decided that I want to make it look like these panels are kind of screwed on there. So I need to put some screws in the corner. So we're gonna make some changes to the blinky light indicator panel thing. Nah, change of mind. I think what we're going to do for attaching this thing is a pop rivet instead because a screw at the size of this thing, um, the detail's just not going to be noticeable and it's not going to be really recognizable as a screw as such. I mean, even the pop rivet I'm planning to do, I'm skeptical it'll be noticeable because I don't want it getting confused for one of these. So for the pop rivet, what we're going to do is we're basically going to make a little dome-like shape with a dimple in the middle. Uh, like a pop rivet would. I'll try to put a pop rivet on screen now. So for that, I can just inset, pull it out, and then inset again and pull it in. Seems easy. It almost looks like an in-hex, actually. I think that'll work perfectly for our fastener. There we go, that gives a little pop rivet there. Um, so now I'm just gonna copy and paste that around, actually, no, screw it, I'm just going to mirror it <laughs> to put that around to all of the corners. There we go, and now that panel's being, you know, held on with something, which is good. Um, and I think we're gonna use the same kind of thing for the, uh, each of the corners of the keyboard uh, so that that looks like it's, you know, in the desk. And now the keyboard is also pop riveted into the thing. Um, the monitor would likely be screwed in from the back, although this monitor, now I think about it, is way too big because about as wide and high as it is, is about how deep it should be, which means either the cabinet's not deep enough for a monitor of that size, or this monitor is just way too big. So I think we're gonna shrink the monitor down just a little bit so that we can have more of these little light panel things, um, as well as, you know, a gauge or two might be good. Which, speaking of a gauge or two, um, I think that's the next thing that we need. Well, this says it's a 50 style pressure gauge. So yeah, I think we'll just have a um, gauge something like this pop riveted into it, I suppose.
Tuki. There we go. We've now got the pop rivets in. Um, and as you can see, there's a little weird thing going over here. And I know exactly what it is because I checked a moment ago. Um, if we go and look at our face orientation, um, it's red and some blue. It should all be blue. Blue means outside. So we're just going to go and I think it's Alt N. Yep, recalculate outside. And now the subsurface division works correctly. And I think it's come out quite nicely. Little bit of weird jank there in the corner, but this thing's going to be so small that a little bit of weird jank there is not really going to be noticed at all. As long as, you know, the insides are on the insides and not on the outsides. And you can stick out the same amount as the blinky light indicator panel thing. And there we go, we've now got a little gauge there that we can use. All right, so that's that element done. Um, what's the next thing that we need for this? There's really only one last element that I really want to apply as far as, you know, panel things to put onto this. Um, and it's a panel that has like little toggle switches with a little indicator light to let you know if, you know, it's flicked on or off. So to do that, I think the plan is to start with the blinky light indicator panel thing. Uh, we'll make a copy of that, we'll stretch it out so that there's some space to put little switches in and we'll more or less just extrude them up to um, make the switch. So we'll do that, see how it goes, um, and see if it needs a bit more thought than the all of three seconds of thought that I've put into that. There we go, there's our little switch thing. Basically, I just took the base of our blinky light. Um, I got rid of the light bit. Uh, just put a face there, extruded it up, and then tucked it in a little bit right at the bottom. Uh, so it looks like it's kind of going down into a ball joint. And then at the top, I flattened it on Y and stretched it out a bit on X, giving us, you know, this little toggle switch type thing, which from, you know, this far back, it looks toggle switchy like, especially if we, you know, move it up or down a bit. And to move it up or down a bit should be super easy, I think, I hope. If we just, you know, grab the top of it and move it on Y. It's flipped up. Um, doesn't look too great this close but remember this piece is going to be like looked at from that far back it you know it looks great from that far back it looks like a toggle switch even um, I am just going to add a little bit more detail around the base where it like you know comes out a bit to where it, there's like a screw screwing it down I think and to do that we're just going to put a control loop bring it down to the same height as this control loop and then grab the faces and expand them out And I think we'll also rotate the top first just to, you know, have that a bit neat. And we'll rotate the other way if the switch is flicked in the other direction. There we go. That makes it look a little bit more significant. So the light looks more like it's just an indicator light and then the switch is the main bit your eye gets drawn to. Now we just need to copy them, stitch them in to the rest of the panel so that we have 10 of them in this panel. Uh, might even make it a bit wider. Maybe I'll think about that. We'll see how it looks. Uh, and then, yeah, this one will be good to go. There we go, we now have our little switch panel with some indicator lights on it. Um, now, we want some of these switches to be up, some to be down, uh, and that's really easy to do with the way we've set it up. We can just uh, go into the mesh itself. We select the ones we want to switch. Let's say we want to flip this one and this one, and yeah, these three are going to be flipped. We go numpad 3 and we just move them on the Y axis to be this way and we also need to rotate. 
somewhere around there-ish. If it's not exactly right on, it's not a big deal, because keep in mind, this panel is going to be very tiny. A smidgen of a deviation is not going to be noticeable. And there we go. We can just pop that one right there if you want, or, you know, put it up on this face for different variations. And I think that almost has all of the little details that we need. Okay, I've decided I don't like the way that these little panels are done. So what we're gonna do instead is we're going to use control loops to create a grid in here. Uh, we will then grab a like a rectangle of the grid, recess them in just to get a little panel gap in, and then we're going to put rivets around it to make it look like the panel is riveted on so that it can be accessed for maintenance if it needs to, but you're gonna have to drill out rivets just because, well, it's the 50s and why make things easy? Okay, we're in the home stretch now. I've done some thinking, and I think these panel gaps are way too big, as they're about half the width of our pop rivet, which is not entirely realistic. So we're gonna shrink those panel gaps down a bit. There we go, that tightens them up a bit, but they do need control loops because that edge is rolling too far. So we're just gonna bring in a control loop to uh, clean those edges up a bit. There we go, that cleans those panel gaps up quite a bit. Um, why is it doing that there? I reckon we've got some verts around the wrong way. So much later that the old narrator got tired of waiting and they had to hire a new one. Ah, I've worked out why it's doing the weird thing here with the subsurf. It's because this edge comes down to here and then doesn't continue across. Well, this, yes, edge comes down along here, doesn't continue across here and up here which is leading to some weird behavior so super easy to get rid of we're going to delete this face and then we need two control loops around this side so the question is where are we going to put the panels the way I'm thinking, there's definitely a panel here at the front, obviously. We've already put that one in. I think this bit up here... Much, much debating later. I reckon we put an ax make the entire back panel an access panel as well. And I mean, we already have the geometry in here that we'd need to do that, which is super convenient. Done. There we go. It's all put in now, and the geometry was a little bit um, fun to try to get it to work in there. Had to do some weird stuff with the way the verts all line up over here, but this is a flat face, so you won't really notice it. And we can still put a straight line up and down there. We just have to bring it right across so that it lines up flat with that, and then move it back. But that works nicely. So now we've got a removable panel on the back. Obviously it uh, needs some work and I think we've probably got some verts that are inside out. Yeah, just a few. I'll just recalculate the outside. Why is it recalculating those to be inside out? Oh, those rings are one face for some reason. That'd be why it's being weird. So 
if I delete that face. So now all that's left to do is the really boring part, uh, set up collections, um, which you know, you go right click new collection, and then we can use uh, our favorite Boolean union with a collection to have it, you know, grab whatever we put in the collection and combine the meshes together. So I'm going to do that off camera and I know. I'll put a render of each different one up and then we'll print some, do some testing and we'll see how we go. That worked better in my head, but here they are, the little computer terminals. Uh, and they've come out really well. Even, I uh, hope I didn't break any of them just then, but even the ones with the little switches, the switches printed out quite nicely. And we did need to adjust the scaling just a little bit to get them to line up with Nora so that the computer, that one doesn't even have a screen. Look, this one has a screen. Uh, the computer monitor lines up with her head nicely. You can't really see it there because the, you know, light's terrible in here. Uh, but I will tr put up a picture to show just how nicely the scaling lines up. Of course, if you don't like the scaling, you can adjust it because it is just ones and zeros in a computer. Now, of course, if you want these files, they are currently on our Patreon link in the up there bit or down there bit, whichever. And they will be there for an indeterminate amount of time, uh, at least three months, but up until I get around to putting them onto the web store. Link also in the down there bit for anything that's not currently on our Patreon. So this one's already been quite long. Like, subscribe, do all that stuff. I'm gonna go and paint some terrain now and we will see you next time. <laughs>